Welcome. On behalf of Trinity's Communication Department and the Lenox Seminar Fund, I want to thank you all for coming tonight. Our speaker, Dr. Kimberly Hamkin, is a maverick in the field of techno technological engineering. Her involvement, leadership, and innovative work as a part of NASA's Human Robot Systems Program has created some out-of-this-world robotic systems that are used in space today. Dr. Hamigan's work in this fascinating field of robotic system applications and software incorporates cutting-edge creativity with innovation. This lecture was made possible by the generosity of Martha, David, and Bagby Lennox Foundation and the leadership of Dr. Henderson. Without further delay, please help me welcome Dr. Hamigan to the stage. Thank you. to discuss with you guys uh, what we do at NASA, what we do in robotics, um, and hopefully share a lot of information with you that you didn't know about NASA. Um, so, let's see. First, I just want to tell you a little bit about myself um, to give you an idea of where I've come from in this field. I went to Vanderbilt University. I stayed there through my PhD, so I kind of got um, into robotics at Vanderbilt, and once you get into robotics at one graduate school, um, changing to a new one is pretty difficult because there's so much to learn. So I ended up staying there and working with, um, you can actually see this robot right here. This was our humanoid robot um, that we had in the Center for Intelligent Systems. And I started working in image processing. That's kind of where my interest um, was, I'd say, about maybe junior, senior year in college. And from there, started working in computer vision, which became, um, led into robotic vision. And then I started working in perceptual systems for robots and eventually got into cognitive systems for robots. Um, so I've kind of spanned the gamut of uh, systems that would let a robot sense the world and understand the world. And in all of that, I actually took quite a few psychology classes and cognitive science classes to learn how people, how you know, people's vision came about and how people use different parts of their brain to understand the world. So um, I, I, I really learned quite a bit about the human side of things, which also led me into this kind of human robot systems area, which we'll get to in a minute. Um, so while I was in grad school, I managed to apply for a NASA graduate student program fellowship, and I actually got that fellowship, didn't think that was gonna happen, and that kind of changed everything. I wasn't really trying to get to NASA. I thought that'd be great to work at NASA one day, but didn't really see an avenue to get there, and so this fellowship kind of changed everything for me. And it also led me to the group that I work with today. So um, you'll see all the robots in that, that we used, or that we built in that group. And I, after I finished my PhD, ended up getting a NASA postdoc with the same group. Um, getting hired on at NASA is a very difficult proposition, so you have to kind of find any avenue you can take to get in. So I managed to get this postdoc, and I, I think I said this so many times today in my class lecture, but I got lucky and got a federal employee position at NASA, so I am now a NASA employee, um, and it's, it's an interesting place to be in. Okay, so um, I, you know, I titled this presentation, um, Do We Need People for Robotic Exploration of Space? And that's a question that comes up a lot uh, because we have the rovers on Mars and they're doing really great work, a lot of folks say, why do we even need to put people out there anymore? Why do we need manned space exploration anymore? And, um, you know, budgets do have a lot to do with that, but there are, there are a lot of things that I think people don't realize that these robots are not going to be able to do, at least in my lifetime. Oh, sorry. Um, or possibly, you know, my generations behind me, their lifetimes. So to, to look at this situation, I've got um, this chart 
basically shows all the missions that NASA might be doing. We're in a very odd state at NASA right now. Our only mission is the space station. Um, we don't have a return to the moon mission. We don't have an official or go to Mars mission. So we have lots of options, but none of them are directed research options. Uh, what this chart shows us is um, where we are right here, we have the space station floating around and we're doing quite a bit of good work um, with the payloads that we have on space station, figuring out how to live on space station. Um, and we're also figuring out how to deal with robots on space station, which is um, a topic that I'll get to talk about a lot here in a little while. And obviously we have the commercial aspect um, just recently, SpaceX and Boeing got um, one contracts to continue to try to provide commercial opportunities to get to space station so that NASA can focus on bigger term things. Um, now, in the future, what we really have is a stepping stone to Mars because everyone, not everyone, the majority of people in the space community think we should be going to Mars if we're going to continue the space exploration process. So one of the things that we're looking at and that you may have heard about recently is um, capturing an asteroid. And that's something that will definitely need robotics to come into play because that's not something we can do fully manned. But uh, I, I, there are areas that I think we're gonna need people and because robots just aren't gonna cut it. Uh, Another option is to go to the moon. Again, we can send robots there. Uh, my group is actually looking at uh, building a prototype rover this next fiscal year for a possible flight project. So we might be putting a rover on the moon in three years time. Um, we might not, but that's always something that's, you know, government funded agencies tend to have things shift and ebb and flow but we're looking at putting a rover on the moon. Now, we're gonna need people involved with that. How will we need them? I'll tell you in a minute. Um, and then the final options are to get to Mars. And there's really two options here. We can go directly to Mars, hope that we keep people alive long enough to get there, and hope we can set them down and keep them alive while we set them down on the ground. <laughs> Um, or we can actually have them in a habitat that's orbiting around Mars and put all the robots on the surface. Uh, that's an option that we've, a lot of people are giving serious consideration to so that we actually have robots doing all the really dangerous work because I mean that's after all, that's why we have robots out here um, so that they can do things that will keep people safe um, that otherwise people, you know, EVAs, um, spacewalks on space station are really dangerous because of micro micrometeorites. If a teeny tiny speck of something hits one of their suits and causes a hole, they have a very small period of time in which they can get back to space station and depressurize. Whereas if we had a robot that got hit by a little teeny tiny meteorite, um, that robot most likely will keep chugging away and we don't have to somebody's life in danger. So um, those are the different mission scenarios with which I'm going to be talking about robots. Um, again, all of them are possible. The only one on this that is actual is space station. Uh, that's pretty much it. So now let's talk about the different ways that we'll be using robots on these um, possible missions. Um, Oh, that didn't come out very well. So this top chart is actually all the different elements that people are thinking will need to go into um, asteroid capture and bring it into a moon orbit and then possibly land on the moon. So it's kind of covering everything. And what I'd like to point out here is this vehicle right here. This is called the Multi-Mission Space Exploration Vehicle. We've got another picture of it right here. Um, and you can see we've got this idea of having robotic arms coming off of this vehicle to 
actually do a lot of exploration work rather than putting a person outside the vehicle and have them dealing with an asteroid. These two top pictures, um, uh, we may want to dim the lights a touch. I think I'm going to get some uh, black background pictures here soon. So these are two of the options for uh, picking up getting an asteroid. Uh, one of them is actually capturing it in this bag-like thing. And this other picture is getting a boulder off an asteroid. Now they both sound like crazy ideas and I fully think they're both crazy ideas, but both of those will need robots to do this. This is not a human job. Um, you know, humans aren't gonna go take a big bag and put it over an asteroid. Um, and, um, and asteroids tend to fly in wonky um, paths, so having people have to follow that path is going to be a whole lot more difficult than having a robot do it. Uh, down here on the bottom left, this is taken from our lunar design architecture that we built up years, well, yeah, years ago when we thought we were going back to the moon. Uh, you can see these two little rover-like things. Um, they actually, look closely enough. This rover and this little MMSEV have a lot of the same properties because they actually come from the same design. Uh, this large thing carries habitats. It's the active robot from uh, the Jet Propulsion Lab uh, out in LA. And we have a mix of other little robots that are roaming around doing things. And what you don't see in this is people. So the question is, um, you know, where are the people do we need them? What would they be doing? And so this is what, this is my opinion, um, having been working in robotics since 1997. I've uh, worked in, with lots of different types of robots, mobile robots, humanoid robots, um, free flying robots, drones if you will. And I do not see a point in the near future where robots are going to be completely autonomous and be able to handle space exploration like we need it handled at an intelligent level. Um, the Mars rovers, they're great. They can go and they can scoop something up and cook it in their oven. They can point a laser at something and get a reading of some chemical, but that's all they can give us, um, that and some imagery. They can't actually tell us what it feels like on Mars they can't estimate um, the properties of something just by looking at it. If, if the Mars rovers don't have the tool on them, they can't measure it. They can't even estimate it. So, um, and we actually just, I think in the last couple of years, have started doing some autonomous driving with the Mars rovers. We tell them a specific point to go to on a map and they get there. And fortunately, there's no like space monkeys flying around that can get in the way or anything like that. So it's just a single robot with nothing else to worry about but a teeny tiny rock or a really big boulder. Um, that's fine, but when we get into multiple robots on surfaces and not really understanding exactly what's on these surfaces or flying around asteroids, we need something that's a lot smarter than what we have and what we probably will have within the next 20 or 30 years. So I personally think that human-robot interaction is going to be necessary for every single mission that we have at NASA. Um, and by human-robot interaction, I mean all types of people interacting with robots. So the different types of human-robot interaction that we have at NASA are um, ground control. Right now we have um, the space station arms, the big Canada arm on the space station that moves large payloads around and actually moves astronauts around, it is controlled from the ground. So there's a person who's actually interacting with that robot on the ground, doing the control, making sure it's moving where it's supposed to, getting all the data. Um, this is actually our most primitive method of operating robots um, because most times we're carrying a person on the end of that arm and so we do some very good, very strong calculations to figure out the exact motion of this arm. Um, they do not move it when we lose signal between mission control and space station, which happens very often throughout the day. Um, and it's really a 
joint by joint motion, what we call bump and wait. Um, so, but supervisory control is a uh, different form. It's a lot more interactive with the human and the robot. And a person can actually, with supervisory control, tell the robot to do kind of high level things. We call them symbolic commands. Um, for instance, if you had a robot that you wanted to pick up a screwdriver and give it to you, our goal is to say, hey robot, go pick up that screwdriver and bring it over here. We're, we're very far from that, of course. Um, but that's a, that's a supervisory control method. And we can do that from the ground, even if we have time delays. This is really um, the area that I, my expertise is in. I have operated many a robot over many a time delay up to um, from about one and a half seconds round trip to 100 seconds round trip. And when you get to those high levels, it's pretty much, um, it's like the Mars rovers. You send it a plan, the robot does it, and it comes back. And that's what we call bump and wait. Um, but in, in between, in, in time delays that we'll see going to the moon, maybe five to 10 seconds round trip, there's a lot of things we think we can do to let the person act like they're controlling a robot real time or interacting with the robot real time. And so supervisory control allows us um, to not necessarily get rid of the time delay or not have to worry about it, but we can mitigate how um, ineffective someone can be when they're interacting with the robot over that time delay. Uh, another mode of interaction is what we call IVA control. That's intravehicular activity. And it's pretty much the notion of, um, let's say a person is in a deep space habitat and there's a robot that's on a Mars moon that they're controlling and they're orbiting around Mars. Um, so there's really no time delay. This would be like a person sitting on Earth controlling a robot that goes into a nuclear disaster. Uh, you have a whole lot more options, but um, a whole lot more options also makes, can make things more difficult because you have too much data coming at you. So you have to start finding better ways to interact with your robot that you aren't standing next to, but you have a direct real-time link to. Um, and supervisory control is another, um, that's another area where we use supervisory control a lot. We also do a lot of direct um, teleoperation. Sometimes to teleoperate tele a robot, you'll put on virtual reality gear so you see what the robot sees. Um, it moves the way you do. Sometimes teleoperation is just a joystick. You tell the robot, go forward, it goes forward. Um, and now there's a lot of different tools that we can use uh, with you know, the Oculus Rift that, just, that has come out is a really cool way to actually control robots. Um, the Leap motion sensors are something we've been working with. So there are a lot of tools that have come out recently that would be really great for directly teleoperating robots. Um, when we're talking about space, none of those items will make it past the vibrations on launch. So um, in space robotics, we're always thinking about you know, what will actually make it into a microgravity environment. And so those tools, while really exciting, don't help a whole lot in this IVA control scenario. Um, and then you've got what we call EVA control. And EVA control can really be just about everything. Uh, it could be you have your tablet and you're telling the robot, go here, go there, do this, do that. Um, what we would prefer is to have some side-by-side -side interaction with robots. So a crew member can tell a robot uh, through their voice what to do or can make gestures. We've done quite a bit of work with um, robot following arm gestures on an astronaut, a suited astronaut. So you know, we have all of these different ways for humans to interact with robots. And even at the very least, if we just put robots on the moon, you still, you always have a human in the loop. I don't see how we're ever going to get around that. Um, so there's always people that are going to be involved in space exploration, even if you're just sending robots. But there are many different things that we'll need um, robots to actually, or people to actually be doing. 
and we have plenty of different ways for people to interact with these robots because we also know we'll need robots on future missions. So now I'm going to tell you about the robots that we have at Johnson Space Center, uh, what they do, and how we interact with them, um, how we expect crew to interact with them, and you know why we need to interact with them. So up here on the top left, we have Robonaut 2. Now this is the second generation Robonaut. When I started out as a graduate student back in the 90s, um, I came in to work with the original Robonaut, and it was uh, really cool for its time. It was the most dexterous um, humanoid robot in the world. Uh, but if you look at it compared to Robonaut 2, it just looks sad and pathetic, so I decided not to take a picture of it. Okay. Uh, but Robonaut 2 was actually developed with General Motors. We did not have any requirements when we developed this robot. Uh, General Motors came to us and said that they wanted to start putting humanoid robots on the factory floor with people uh, making their cars. They didn't want to have to rely solely on industrial robotics that are in a cage that people couldn't interact with. They wanted real-time interaction with people and robots. Um, and so they came to us and decided that we built the best humanoid in the country. And we put together a Space Act agreement and started building Robonaut 2. And I mean, we just, we built it. The mechanical and electrical engineers at NASA went to town with whatever they wanted. Um, its bicep circumference is about the size of Arnold Schwarzenegger's. So it's a really large um, robot. And if it had a full lower torso, we actually have a mock-up um, in my boss's office of the full torso, or full upper and lower body robot. And I think it's about 6'5". It's huge. It's just nobody needs a robot that's 6 foot 5. So, um, but what happened was the space station, uh, they were flush with money at some point a few years ago, and they said they wanted a robot on space station. This is, this is the direction they were going in, putting experimental payloads on space station to try it out. So what we did was we um, got Robonaut 2, we had two of them, and we built one of them, or we modified one um, to make it through vibration on launch and to get through the radioactive testing and to get through the off-gas testing because if this thing off-gassed on space station, it could kill people. So we had three years of testing that we got through in six months and managed to get this thing up to space station. And so as you can see, there it is playing with an astronaut. Um, in this second picture, this is Robonaut 2 with its climbing legs. Again, we didn't design this thing to go on space station because we would have designed something more agile, smaller, um, that probably would have fit a little better into space station. But uh, the legs were developed, um, we call them in robotics, the, the best kind of manipulator is really a, a seven degree freedom manipulator, which just means you have seven joints um, on the robot. And we have seven dock arms on the robot, and we needed to get these legs done quickly. So we're basically using the same control software that we have on the arms to put on the legs. So the legs became these very long, unwieldy looking things. And I have some video. Um, unfortunately, I just have animation video of the leg, but it looks pretty cool. Um, and and a, a side note on Robonaut 2, the reason it's humanoid in form is because we have been trying to get a robot on space station, and we just wanted it to fit into the astronauts' world. We didn't want to tell space station, oh, we've got this great robot that could really help you out, but you're going to have to change some of the hatches and make special tools for it. We just wanted it to go up there and work with everything that the people on space station were working with. Um, this bottom picture, this is what we call Centaur 2. It's you know half Robonaut, half ATV. Uh, we had we did the same thing for the original Robonaut. We called it Centaur, so lo and behold, Centaur two. Um, and this this chassis is really interesting. It's an instance of we let our mechanical um, engineers 
be very clever, and they were too clever for their own good because it's a very difficult robot to control. Um, but it's really cool. Looks cool. Um, let's see. And then up here we have our space exploration vehicles. These were, the first one right here was developed for return to the moon. It originally was just a rover that astronauts were going to drive. And then we developed this cabin, so it was basically an astronaut RV. Uh, but while we were developing this, you can actually see some of the instruments. We outfitted it with cameras and sensors so that it could still be a robot. It could drive on its own, avoid obstacles, you know, not go over a cliff. Um, because what we really wanted to do was, once an astronaut crew was done with all these toys on the moon, they would take off, and the plan was every six months we would have a new crew go to the moon. So we wanted to be able to move all the toys to the new location rather than have to send up all the same things again. Um, because obviously that would cost a lot of money if we didn't have to relaunch these things every time. So we wanted to be able to have these things drive themselves to a new location every six months. Um, and then the MMSEV is the multi-machine space exploration vehicle. That was pretty much the second generation um, SEV, but at that point, things shifted from the moon to asteroids. And so what did we do? We took something that we had been working on for the moon, and then we made it a technology that should be usable for any asteroid missions. Um, and that's kind of the key to all of our robots is we start developing them for one mission in mind, but we know that that mission's gonna go away and change into something new because it just always does at NASA. And, um, you know, even with Robonaut, we started out as just a robot that would climb around the space station, but then the lunar um, vision came about, and so we started making it mobile so it could actually roam around on the moon. So um, this has helped us a lot in continuing development with things instead of shutting down a project and then starting something brand new for another mission and it has nothing to do with what we were doing. Um, which brings me to this one right here. Um, this is what we call Valkyrie. If you ever see it in online or in the news, they may call it R5. Um, we had a little tussle with headquarters about the name Valkyrie. Apparently there's some sort of Nazi connotation with it. Um, <laughs> did not realize that at the time. Um, but this robot we built for the DARPA Robotics Challenge, which was um, a robotics competition that the um, Department of Defense's Advanced Research Projects Agency uh, started. And let's see, October 2012 was the official beginning date for that. And what happened was um, the sky at DARPA saw how poor the robotic response was to the um, Fukushima disaster in Japan back in 2011. And um, apparently all they really needed um, to stop a lot of damage at that nuclear reactor was for someone to shut off some valves, but they couldn't send people in and lo and behold, Japan didn't actually have a robot they could send in to go do that. We all assumed Japan out of everyone would have the robot that could do that, but they didn't. And um, so that kind of shook a lot of people up. And the, one of the project managers at DARPA said, we, we have to start pushing this. Um, you've all seen the Google autonomous driving car. Yes, you, or you know it's out there at least. Uh, so the reason that exists is because of a DARPA grand challenge that this agency created um, and it pushed people to develop autonomous driving. So within, I think that was within about five years, we actually had companies working on autonomous vehicles. So Gil Pratt at DARPA decided that that's the direction we needed to go in for humanoid robots. Um, we're never gonna get anywhere unless we just start pushing people and making these crazy challenges. So he came up with this idea to develop a robot um, in 15 months that can climb a ladder, turn a valve, um, drive a small Polaris type vehicle. Um, let's see, 
anyone else. Uh, use a drill that could actually cut through drywall. Um, and there's, there's like four more things. But basically, when I heard about this, I was very excited about it um, and thought that's just whack. Nobody's going to be able to do any of this stuff in 15 months. Um, and the other thing they were doing was providing a robot to some teams who didn't have the money to actually, and expertise to go and build a robot. Uh, but we felt we had the expertise to build a robot. So this is what we built. And um, we failed miserably at this challenge. We got zero points. Um, but we put our all into it. And we just, we had some kinks that didn't get worked out until pretty much our chance was over. But we did have a robot that could actually walk and do um, a few of the different tasks. And now we're working with um, another group that's experts in walking who weren't working with us originally. So she's actually, um, she's on her way. I think that we're going to have some pretty interesting things come out of this robot in the next few years. So these are the robots. Um, all of them have to be controlled by a human. There has to be a human with all of these robots. None of them can go off and do anything on their own. So, let's get to the next one. This is a video of Romanot 2. Oh, that's why. Um, on the space station. And this was the first activity we did with the robot. Um, it's just basically going to shake the astronaut's hand. It's not that exciting as far as videos go, but it, it's pretty cool that it's on the space station. The way that we're operating this right here, I think I misspoke in the earlier lecture. This was actually done, the astronaut on board used a program on a computer right next to him. So it's pretty much um, a side-by-side -side operation. And the robot is really just doing the same exact thing over. It's just a script. It does the same thing over and over. There's not any interaction with the world um, on this handshake operation. But so, I mean, you can see this was about not quite two years ago, uh, maybe about a year and a half ago. And this was the first thing we did. Um, there's not a whole lot that's been done since because we needed astronauts to run this robot. Um, and we needed people in mission control to run this robot. And astronauts cost a lot of money. And they have a lot of other things to do on space station. So we haven't gotten very far with Romanot on space station because um, we just we don't have time. The astronauts have very little time to do any testing with it. Uh, fortunately, you'll see in a few minutes um, with its legs, we just got the legs attached on the robot on the space station. And we are now allowed to engineers get to operate it from our own building without mission control or astronauts involved. So we're really excited about that. And hopefully, this is the start of us getting some really interesting work done. And in the next few years, uh, you know, humanoid robot on the space station will be some pretty cool news, and you'll see it doing cooler things than shaking hands with an astronaut. Um, this, is, this is more of the type of thing that the robot's going to do. Um, as a caretaker on the space station. So this is the robot just cleaning a handrail. But apparently the astronauts hate cleaning the handrails. They have to clean every handrail every Saturday morning. Um, and so they would really prefer to have Romanot up there doing this sort of thing for them, maybe while they're sleeping, so that it's not even in its way. <coughs> Um, this is operated from the ground. So this is someone using visual information from the cameras to help place the robot, you know, tell the robot where its hand needs to go. There is a little more um, intelligence involved in this task. Um, but again, it's, it, it wouldn't be able to do this without a human sitting at a station telling it what to do. However, you can see that Sonny Williams is actually taking lots of pictures, so um, we don't need to involve the astronauts so much on this sort of thing anymore. And uh, from here on out, we're hoping that we can move towards that super e supervisory control paradigm I talked about um, uh, for this robot. And uh, that's kind of what I'll be working on for the next year, I think. Yeah. Uh, here we go. So, like I said, we just got the robot's legs attached up on the space station, and
and um, we haven't even powered it on yet, so there's not really anything I can show you that's cool with the legs because I don't have any video of that. But what I do have is an animation. Um, and this just shows you what the robot's going to actually be like climbing around. You can see the two inset pictures are um, the feet, not really feet, but they are the end of the leg manipulators. Um, and they have little cameras in them that will allow us to go find these handrails, uh, which is what the robot has to use. The robot's not gonna be flying through the space station like astronauts do. Apparently they just push off from a wall and Superman thing through the big tube, but this robot's going to definitely need to um, attach itself at all times. And th the really cool thing is that the feet also have um, those little grippers can turn into something that plugs into what we call a sea track, which is just another way to hang on to things on space station. So it's got a few different um, <coughs> multi-purpose use down there, and the hope, although I think I just found out this was killed, the hope is that we get this robot on the outside of space station to start doing the things that I was talking about earlier um, because it's very dangerous for astronauts to be out there. Granted, it will not take the place of astronauts. Um, the things they do are very meticulous and very, um, you need actual intelligence from a human brain to do them. So, but we can at least do some platform setups for the astronauts. Um, do tiny maintenance tasks like replacing handrails that have um, that have gotten damaged somehow. So um, we might be going EVA within two years. We might not. I, um, that all just depends on funding, like everything else. Okay. So this is a haphazard video of our Centaur 2 and SEV um, out in one of our analog field tests. For several years in a row, we did something called Desert Rats, which was, um, we took a lot, a lot of robots from all over NASA, took a bunch of astronaut, um, mostly astronaut candidates, and went out to a, an Mars or lunar-like landscape and just started testing all of our equipment um, because we really needed to start figuring out how people were going to work on the moon or on the Mars with all of these robots around them. So this is a picture of um, Centaur 2 doing its thing. That is an actual um, supervisory control task. The um, robot, this, I was actually controlling it from Houston, while this robot was in Arizona somewhere, um, and I would tell it what what area it needed to move its hand to because that's where the rock was, and it would go out and reach out, and once the force sensors felt enough force um, on the arm, it would stop, and then it would close its hand because it knew it grabbed something, and five times out of ten, it would actually grab the rock. Um, but you know, failure rate's pretty big on these robots. So, um, but then the driving was really just joystick driving uh, because I don't really remember why we joysticked it at the time. Um, but usually we can actually tell it to go somewhere and it will drive itself there. These are the two SCVs. Um, you know, obviously they were built to have people driving them because they are rovers, but um, a lot of the work I've done over the years is driving those rovers one year, I think I had to log 100 miles, which sounds crazy, but um, there's a lot of room out in this lava desert area. Um, the, the rovers were actually, you can see, they were built to drive in any direction. Um, They're all electric, so uh, we were able to package things really interestingly, um, and that technology has actually spawned off some um, interesting innovations that never got a press release. Um, but we're looking at, you know, possibly getting this technology into maybe some automotive fields. Um, let's see, I think up next. So one of the really cool things about this area is that we can go out there and pretend like it really is the moon. Um, you can see this is one of the payloads that we put on the Centaur 
to base to make it something more than just a robot mobility base. And um, you can see from that that it's really kind of fluffy, light, blowy dirt. Um, now, the moon isn't going to have any wind. Mars will, but the moon won't. Um, and of course, Mars wind will just come and bury us all the ocean. But what's really interesting is that um, this happened by accident. This was a basalt mine, I think. And the driver of the rover just started plunging down. He wasn't actually making this happen. Um, so what we got to see was that this, this was very much like lunar regolith, which is very fluffy because there's no atmosphere to compact the dirt. So we were actually getting some really cool um, data that this rover could still manage to make it through that. Now, I can't imagine what that would have looked like if I was driving that from Houston. I probably would have thought I'd killed the rover. Um, but, and the rest of this is just some shots of things happening out in the field. But what we learned, I mean, these field tests are where we learn the most about how we're going to interact with these robots over time delays, um, over nasty networks that may drop a lot of data. And I, I feel pretty confident that um, we've gotten to a point where we kind of know the direction to go in so that when we do have these robots somewhere else, uh, we'll be able to operate them in a manner that makes the most of you know, their assets and people's assets. and realized I was always by myself back at the ranch. And so I don't have any video of what I did. Um, but then this, this dark robotics challenge, we started realizing we needed to start showing people that there's actually a person on the other end. So um, I believe this one, power tool manipulation. This is the robot driving a drill. Now, just FYI, at some point we took the legs off because people needed to concentrate on the walking and we needed to concentrate on the upper body manipulating things, so she's cut in half right now. Um, but you can see on the top left corner, that's the interface that I use to do all of these tasks. And what we found was we started operating in a virtual world. Um, we could actually get the robots, um, most robots today use some really sophisticated sensors to get data back. And we can get 3D data back very easily. They're much better than using cameras. Um, and the thing is, is that that 3D data shows up very well in a virtual um, environment. So we put the robot in that virtual environment, all the data it gets back in that environment. And then what we ended up doing was creating these templates. Um, now this was fortunate because we knew what we had to do. We had eight things we had to do. So we could make a drill template because we knew we were going to have to pick up a drill and use it. But it, it turned out to be a really useful way of operating the robot to put this drill in the robot's virtual environment. Um, we could assign hand positions to tell it how to go about grasping the drill. And um, then when we needed to use it, we could do the same thing, um, you know, tell it where to move its arm. And it, what was fantastic was when we got to the point where, oh, um, we almost grabbed the drill, but we see that we're about an inch off because data is never calibrated. Um, all you had to do was just move this little thing in your visual world, and then the robot had grabbed it. Um, we had been dealing with that concept of the robot's just an inch off from what it needs to be doing, and we always had to go back and start again, but this method allowed us to actually start changing the way we interact with the robot. Um, the most interesting thing about this, though, is that we found out when we got to the DARPA Robotics Challenge trials last December, almost every other team did the same thing. None of us knew we were doing the same thing because we were working crazy hours and not talking to anybody outside of work. But <coughs> um, the, a majority of the teams figured out that this is how they needed to be interacting with the robot. So what that says to us is that because of the DARPA Robotics Challenge, 
we've actually converged on a way to um, do some supervisory control of humanoid robots. And even though we failed miserably at NASA, um, I think finding this out and then being able to go to people at NASA and say, this is what we need to be doing. We need to start getting some money to actually look into this um, was a really useful thing to come out of that miserable disaster. <laughs> And then this next one is the same kind of thing. It actually puts into perspective the entire user experience. Um, I, whenever I was running this robot, I was shielded from it. I couldn't see it because we were going to be in garages away from where these robots were competing. So I'm, I've got like whiteboards and stuff blocking me from seeing that robot. Um, but again, I'm using this virtual um, visualization and moving it around, and it, you'll see when the robot starts turning its valve, there, we had finger issues. Robotic fingers are never, they, they always fail. So um, there's a point where a finger is not closing or opening, I can't remember. And um, I had to start readjusting the way I was interacting with the robot because of that. And um, although this is sped up, I think, maybe four times, um, it still, it would have been so much longer. We had to do each of these tasks in 30 minutes or less, and it, it would have taken 30 minutes just to turn a valve one rotation if I had to restart every time a finger didn't close or the hands didn't go exactly where they were supposed to. So um, that's kind of the whole user experience. And it really looks interesting. Fast forward it a little bit. Um, and then on the right, we actually have uh, a tool that we created that lets us kind of on the fly create robotic behaviors, um, such as turning a wheel and to make it interact with this visualization. So, oh, there we go. That's it. The thumb was not opening. But, you know, I managed to get it done anyway. So, and that's the very, very exciting one. Um, because I wanted to get people to come out and check out the presentation. Uh, but I, I people, uh, you know, space exploration without people is just, for many reasons, not a good idea. Um, we need people to interact with these robots. Uh, and mostly, we really, a lot of us feel that we need people to experience the human aspect of it. Um, you know, Matt, you know, no robot could have told us what it was like to hop on the moon like all of those astronauts that got to do that did. No robots could have told us how really awe-inspiring it was to come around the dark side of the moon and see the Earth rise. Um, yeah, we can see pictures of that, but for them to actually explain what it was like is a pretty cool thing. So I think um, keeping people in the loop is a necessary feature space exploration. So um, I think we're ready to take some questions. Any questions? If I don't know the answer, I'll tell you I don't know. But anything about NASA, anything about robots, anything about me? Well, almost anything about me. <laughs> oh, yeah, we're going to use the microphone.
so no one really knows. Um, what? You you outsourced Orion to high school students. I got to work on it for three years. Well, here, well, that's cool for you, actually. Um, but I'm not really sure what's going to take us to Mars. Um, I don't know that anybody does know what's really going to take us to Mars. So um, these are all probable missions in the future. That's you know that's pretty much all I can tell you. I actually try to stay out of the whole. Um, launch propulsion crew vehicle um, areas and just focus on the robots that will need to do some cool stuff. But I think that's the, the thought is that at some point Orion or a new version of Orion and the SLS will get us to Mars. And I don't know when that will be. You mentioned that uh, you have a background in like uh, how the human mind works, and you use that to help make the robots work better. Are you the only one in your team that has that background? And if you are, do you think that works to your advantage? Actually, um, I'm probably one of just a couple of folks in my specific um, division that has that sort of background, and um, I found that it made me completely stand out. So I'm really the only one that has that kind of knowledge. Um, most of our robotics people, most of our robotics people are really mechanical and electrical engineers. Um, so we have very few software folks. But a lot of the software people didn't study those different areas. And, um, and I found quite recently, I've been doing some um, higher level work talking about you know the future, where we should be going instead of just the technical stuff. And I'm finding that my ability to straddle both worlds like that and still see the human side with the robot side um, has helped a lot and um, will probably continue to be a good thing in the future and give me some really interesting opportunities. So um, yeah, I'm really happy that I, I took those other classes that were not engineering um, and diversified. Going kind of into the control of the robots, it looked like uh, a lot of the robots were maybe not easily, but uh, without too much effort, they were able to be, they're really versatile and uh, changing from doing one task to another. So I was just wondering uh, what kind of control software you use, something like ROS to control the robots or to give commands. Yeah, I actually had a discussion with someone earlier. We, um, we do use ROS on our Robonaut 2. ROS is um, actually, well, this is pretty interesting. It's called the Robot Operating Software, and it is um, an open source software that was developed so that people stopped creating their own um, software algorithms for robotics from scratch. What we found was everyone was creating their own navigation software, but everybody was using the same thing. And so this group um, started writing this software that would let everyone use the same software to talk, and then you could start using other people's navigation software or other people's vision software. And they made it open source so that everyone could use it for free. And I'm a huge proponent, proponent of open source software. Um, and so, and we're the government, and we've also kind of funded this group that does the um, Keep It Up. So we started using it on Robonaut 2. Um, Valkyrie was all ROS. Um, and we're pushing, I'm actually, those tools that you saw, I'm pushing to get those open source released for um, NASA so that anyone can just go download the software and use it. For the specific control, um, we, are you talking, like we do a lot of impedance control and torque control for the robots so that we can actually control how much torque we're getting in as opposed to, um, controlling the position of the robot and hoping that it's kind of torque to actually make it get there. Uh, but it's also really difficult. Um, we did, with Valkyrie, fall back to some position control. So we just told the joints where to go and um, cross our fingers. Um, but those are the two um, areas that we're really moving towards. Is that kind of um, what you're looking for? Yeah, uh, that and also uh, as far as uh, like kind of moving forward from just uh, position control.
people. Um, is there anything in the work kind of using uh, uh, like probability estimation of where it might be using some sort of like visual sensor of uh, like seeing where like an arm is and using that data? Oh, uh, visual odometry type stuff? Yeah. Yes, that's actually my one of the other women, or like three other women in my group. That's her huge thing right now. She is all over visual odometry. So visual odometry is a way to let, it's basically like an internal GPS for robots, um, especially for space robots. There's no GPS on the moon. You know, we don't have satellites floating around the moon telling electronics where they are on the moon. So we need to develop this way of telling the robot where it is. And visual odometry is very difficult, um, but it is, when done correctly, it can be very accurate in telling the robot, allowing the robot to map itself out. So we are actually actively working some visual odometry for, um, we're gonna try it out on um, Valkyrie first, because Roadnut 2 on Space Station is very difficult to get software onto. Um, going through Space Station safety and certification processes takes a long time. But um, that's the joy of having all these different robots. Um, the, there's another center, the Ames Research Center. They do a lot of visual odometry too, and they're really um, focused on rovers. So I think that they're um, looking at putting some on our possible lunar rover that we might be creating. But that's definitely the area we have to move in if we want to be able to tell where the robot is. So, yes. Mm -hmm. Any questions? Ask me anything. I have two, is that okay? That's great. Okay, so um, the Valkyrie, I'm just curious as to why you went with a four-finger design instead of five-finger like the human hand. Okay. Um, well, so we have a team of engineers that actually do hand design. Uh, the, the really cool thing about Johnson Space Center is all of our robotics were designed and built by people, NASA employees. Um, you know, we didn't farm it off to Boeing to go build and then bring back to us. We do, we do actual engineering in-house at NASA. Um, some people don't believe it, but we do. And so our hand um, experts had decided we knew what we needed to do with this robot. Uh, we were not going to need very fine um, position control with the hands, um, whereas with Robonaut, we had designed the hands to be very dexterous, and um, there's an old video of Robonaut 1, actually, it, um, I think it's like a needle, it's actually spinning a needle around between its fingers, which was amazing for the time. Um, but so we knew we didn't need the dexterity, and one more finger meant a whole lot more electronics packaged in the forearm and it just meant more bulk, and we knew we weren't gonna get anything out of that pinky finger. Um, on most of our hands, the forefinger and the thumb are the only two that really do a lot of motion. The last ones just open and close. So if we drop that from three down to two, we basically lost nothing and gained a whole lot of space. So that's the reason for um, going down to four, and I'm really happy you caught that. Okay, and then my other question might be kind of out there. So, uh, in like science fiction at least, we have like a history of kind of overestimating robotics. Yeah. You know, like in 2001 Space Odyssey, oh, yeah. HAL, and we're going to Jupiter, it's 2001, no. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but anyways, I was wondering like conversely to that, is there any way you think like the general public underestimates robotics? Like is there something you're doing with robots that you think uh, people would be startled that we're at that level? Um, so what I find, we bring a lot of people in for tours at NASA. Obviously, it's you know a tax-funded place, and we need to let everybody see what we're doing, which we're very happy to do. Um, and I, when I'm talking to people, I get the, oh, robots can do all this stuff, and I'm like, you have, no, I get the robots are going to take over the world. You know, when are they going to take over the world? And I'm like, you, you just don't even know. They, they can't even see to grab a stick and. Um, so, well, some of them. But um, what I find, I don't know that there's anything that we're doing that um, people underestimate, but when people actually come and see the robots, 
do what they do, everyone's kind of for it. Um, seeing it, I think, for real, and that it's an actual electromechanical being that's doing something really cool looking, uh, kind of takes people by surprise. So I wouldn't say that there's any underestimation going on. I think most people overestimate what robots can do, what they will be able to do soon. But it definitely, in reality, it's, it's a big shock for people to see robots working. Um, so I think they underestimate how cool it is when you finally get to see something, you know, when you finally get to see a robot too doing something right in front of you or shake its hand, people are blown away. So, good question. I have a third one. If Go ahead. <laughs> So 
having things that shoot these lasers out and return um, back to a mirror to tell you how far away something is made the biggest difference in robotics. And it allowed us to start doing some really um, interesting navigation work, manipulation work, because now we actually could see. We didn't have to hope that our vision processing was good enough um, to give us the data we needed. And it's also let us make the robots a little more autonomous because they have all of that data on their, what we call brainstem, and um, they can use it to do some really fast processing. And then the speed for processors, that changed everything too. There was, at some point, um, within the last 10 years, we went from it's still not good enough to hold a cow, we can get everything we knew to need to do real-time walking, real-time um, grasping, uh, recovering from dropping things, that sort of thing. So um, the, the electronic technology made the biggest change, but then what I'm seeing just in the last year or so is um, there's something coming up called cloud robotics. And a lot of people are thinking, you know, there's so much information that robots need to know and understand to make them intelligent. Why don't we just start uploading all of it um, to a cloud and let robots pull from this cloud so they can go into some cloud library and pull the template for detecting a door so that you don't have to create that. Um, your robot just automatically has it. And this actually is one of the things that people are speculating that Google is doing. Um, Google went and bought up all the robotics companies last year. Um, almost everyone we competed against at this Darker Robotics Challenge got bought by Google. And then we failed miserably and we worked for the government, so that was that just kind of compounded our misery. Um, but we don't know what they're doing, what they're planning on doing with all these robots, because they've bought the best robotics companies doing some really interesting work. And this is speculation that they're trying to put a robot brain on the cloud and allow everyone's robots to kind of use that brain. So I think we're starting to see some really cool stuff with um, you know, cloud computing and Wi-Fi being everywhere, um, being able to take advantage of that. So it, it, it hasn't stopped yet, and it's, um, it's been pretty interesting over the years to see that change. to an artificial intelligence world and see 
see where we can make these things collide and hope we can come up with um, some new methods that will eventually get us to some smart robots. But it's, it's definitely, uh, AI plays a huge part. It's just how do you define AI, you know? <laughs>